Good evening, and we would like to welcome each of you as we continue this series on the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this particular part, we are covering Revelation, the 13th chapter through the 16th chapter. And tonight we're beginning with the first part of the 14th chapter. In that 14th chapter are three angels. And so tonight we're taking a look at the first angel, the first angel's message. What does that angel have to say? What does it mean to you and to me? Very, very vital subject. And so we hope you'll get your Bible and paper and pencil and follow along. And those of you that are watching by television, thank you for tuning in again. Those of you that are listening by the radio, welcome and also on the internet. We're glad that each of you are joining us and we hope that as we go through this, it'll be clear. This is a, a subject tonight where you really need to probably have a pad and a pencil and so you can uh, put down some things as we go through uh, because we're going to be doing, uh, I guess you want to call it quite a bit of mathematics tonight. And so follow along as we, we take a look at it and we hope it'll, it'll bless you in a special way. Our subject tomorrow evening is entitled The Second Angel's Message. And that me angel is crying out, Babylon is fallen. And I'd just like to clarify something. This message it talks about here is about the fall of Babylon. And that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow evening. But the destruction of Babylon doesn't take place, folks, until you hit the 18th chapter. And so uh, just so as you're reading and studying, you'll be able to put that together because one talks about its fall, the other talks about the destruction of Babylon. So uh, uh, follow as we go along with it. But tonight, we're taking a look at the first angel, the first angel's message and uh, what the Scripture tells us about this angel and what it, he has to say. So we hope you'll enjoy it as we go through Revelation, the 14th chapter. We'd like to welcome back the... His Voice Quartet. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed them as much as I have. Uh, they've been a real uh, blessing to us here, and we're just glad that they're here tonight. They're going to be singing a medley tonight of two songs, uh, one, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues, and To God Be the Glory. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy that. But before they sing, I'm going to ask Chuck to come and to share the Scripture that we're going to be looking at tonight. Good evening. If you have your Bible again, let's turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, we're going to read verses 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Let's read together. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. May God add His blessing to His word tonight. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing My great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The glories of my God and King The triumphs of His grace The triumphs of his grace. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. 
who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be Our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the whole world hear. Heavenly Father, tonight as we come before the, you, we come, Lord, first to give you honor and glory and praise, thankful that you are righteous and just in all that you do. Bless us tonight as we take a look that this message that you have given is to be proclaimed to all the world to prepare us for the coming of Jesus. We pray that our hearts may be open and we might be receptive to your word. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. There's two things in this first angel's message that I want us to look at tonight. And so we'll go back and take a look at the text. And it says here, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, to, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth and sea and the springs of water. Two things in there that we want to look at tonight. And one, we want to look at the hour of God's judgment has come. That's what we want to establish. And the other is, worship Him who made heaven and earth. Those are the two things that we're going to look at tonight. So, uh, follow along now as we take a look at what the Scripture has to say about the hour of God's judgment. You see, God's judgment is based upon His law. In fact, all judgment is based upon law. You have to, it has to be that way. Uh, you wouldn't dare have it any other way, so it has to be based on law. So what I'd like for us to do is to take a look at what the Scripture has to say about God's law. What does it tell us about God's law? Therefore, the law is, okay, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and 
good. So when you take a look at God's law, Scripture tells us that His law is holy, it's just, it's good. Those are the characteristics of God's law. That they're holy, it's just, it's good. So if God is going to base His judgment upon His law, then things must come up to that. If they don't come up to that, then we're in trouble. It also says this about God's law. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sowed under sin. So the Bible tells us that God's law operates in the spiritual realm. God's law is spiritual. It's holy. It's just. It's good. So, uh, there's nothing wrong with God's law. I run on to people who uh, attack God's law, or they try to do away with it and say that it doesn't apply today. But, dear friend, if you do that, we're in serious trouble. See? So, God's law, very, very important. The problem is not with God's law. The problem is with us. Because the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And therefore, since that is the problem, and that I am carnal, sold under sin, then it says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. You see, law, I don't care what law you're talking about. Whether you're talking about God's law or whether you're talking about man's law does not make any difference. All law demands that if you break it, a penalty has to be paid. If there's no penalty on a law, nobody pays any attention to it. I've been some places in the world where there wasn't a penalty, or at least it was not enforced, and nobody paid any attention to it. See? But in order for the law to have any strength, to have any uh, say, to have any power, it has to have a penalty, and God turns around and places the supreme penalty on breaking His law because it tells us that the wages of sin is death. So, it's very clear that you and I, sorry, we're in trouble because we are carnal, sold under sin. We are guilty, if you please, of breaking God's law. That we are, all of us. And the penalty for that is death. So this is the basis of the judgment. Now it says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Those are going to be judged by the law of liberty? How is there liberty in the law? That's what it says. So, you know. Be judged by the law of liberty. How does that that happen? Well, it only happens as you understand what Christ has done. That's the only way there is liberty. And it says God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were, what? Still sinners, Christ died for us. Marvelous text, folks. If you don't have that one underlined in your Bible, you should underline it because it makes it clear that God didn't say, straighten up, fly right, do what is right, and then I will love you. It says that God demonstrated his love and that he came and he died for us while we were still sinners. So God loves you just exactly like you are. That's the way God loves you. 
His love does not change. I mean, it just doesn't change because of your behavior. That does not change God's love. He died for you. He loves each one. And therefore, this is something that he did for you and for me. He came and he died. All right. Now, I want you to follow because what we're talking about tonight centers around the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary was a compartment called the most holy place. And in that compartment was a piece of furniture called the ark. Okay? And on that ark, or beside that ark, were two angels. And in between those two angels was what was called the mercy seat. That is where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. In the ark, down in the chest, in the ark, was the law. The Ten Commandments. That is extremely important. If you don't understand that, dear friend, grab hold. Because that is very, very vital. Because I'm going to read a text to you that makes all the difference. The mercy seat was there above. Get it clear. It was above the law. It did not have the law above the mercy seat, but the mercy seat was above the law. Okay, let's look. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Only as you and I understand the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ that's given to each one of us, only then, and only then, then you find liberty in the law. Because I find what Christ did for me has set me free. I am no longer when I accept him, I am no longer under condemnation. The law and I are no longer at odds. When I am away from Christ, I don't know Christ, the law can only condemn. But when I come to Christ, and he who died for me, and loves me, and gives to me, if you please, his righteousness, only then can I stand before the law and are at peace with God's law. Okay, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, listen folks, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life if I hear God's word I believe in Christ I believe in what he did for me I accept his death I accept his righteousness in my behalf watch shall not come into judgment but has passed from death unto life Wonderful that if I come to Christ, that I have passed from death unto life, I do not come into judgment. How is that possible? That I don't come into judgment. Well, it's possible in a sense that Christ stands in your place. You don't come into judgment. Christ stands in your place in the judgment. Let me tell you a little secret. If Jesus Christ, which the Scripture says is your advocate, your mediator, okay? If he is your advocate and your mediator, 
he's never lost a case. You can't lose. See? But dear friend, let me tell you, the truth of it is, if you don't have Christ, you don't stand a chance. It's just, just that true. So with you accept Christ, he takes your place, stands in your place in the judgment. Okay. Jesus is coming back. When he comes back, every case will have been decided. Every case will have been decided. Because it says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Christ tonight is our advocate. He's our representative. He represents us before God, but there's going to come a day when he's going to stop, and he's going to take off his robes as priest, ministering in your behalf and mine, and he's going to put on his robes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's going to say those words. He's going to say, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. God in his mercy has done everything he can do for mankind. Probation has closed. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. The curtain of mercy has fallen and Jesus comes back. So it tells us here that when he comes, he's going to bring what? His reward with him. It says that every case has been decided. He's bringing his reward with him. You can't pass out rewards and then have judgment later. That doesn't work. Let's look at another one about that. For the Son of Man will come in His glory, in the glory of His Father and of His angels, and then He will, what? Reward each one according to His works. So every case has been decided when Jesus comes. So let's take a look. If every case is decided, then judgment has to have already taken place. So when he says the hour of God's judgment has come, let's take a look at that. It's mentioned in the book of Daniel. Daniel, the eighth chapter. And the eighth chapter in verse 14 says, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Okay, I told you, this centers pretty much around the sanctuary. Said unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed shall be cleansed. That was known as the day of atonement, or if you please, the day of judgment. That's what it was known as. And on this particular day, all of Israel came up to the sanctuary. And on that day, the high priest was going to go through the holy place, which you see on the screen, and he was going to part that veil, and he was going to walk in before the ark. Going to walk in before the ark where the Shekinah glory of God was, but also where the mercy seat is, and underneath that was the law. That's what he's going to go in there. And he's going to go in and he's going to confess the sins of Israel. The cleansing of the sanctuary was to place. Now, this text says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 
can't be referring to the one on earth. Had to be referring to the one up in heaven. So watch now as it begins to explain it. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So you must keep in mind, if you got your pad, your notebook and stuff, you must put, keep in mind that we are talking about 2,300 days. Don't lose that fact that we're explaining 2,300 days. Okay? So in 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. When Daniel had that vision, he didn't understand it. He couldn't put it together. And so when you move into the ninth chapter of Daniel, Daniel is praying that God will help him understand. That it will give him some understanding of this vision. And while Daniel is praying, this is what happened. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So he's praying, and while he's praying, God has sent this angel Gabriel to Daniel, and he sent him to him for this purpose. And he informed me and talked to me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. So he said, I've come, Daniel, in answer to your prayer to help you understand this vision. So I want you to watch this evening as the angel Gabriel tells Daniel what's involved here and puts it all together step by step so that he can understand. To begin with, here in Daniel, he says, the angel Gabriel's telling Daniel, 70 weeks are determined. 70 weeks are determined. Now, out of that 2,300 years, 70 weeks of it are determined. For what? Okay? For your people and your holy city. In other words, he's saying God is giving the Jewish people 70 weeks. That's what he's telling them. And in that 70 weeks, the, he's asking that they do these things. Okay? To finish the transgression. Stop. Stop sinning. Stop doing the things they were doing. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. These were the things that God said to the Jewish people. I'm going to give you 70 weeks. And in that 70 weeks... This is what you need to accomplish. Okay. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and the holy city. Well, I can have 70 weeks, but it really doesn't mean anything. Didn't mean anything to Daniel. Didn't mean anything to you or me unless we can find a starting point. If you can't find a starting point, Nothing fits, okay? So the angel Gabriel doesn't leave him in doubt. He gives him a starting point. He says here in Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So he's giving him a starting point. He's saying, Daniel, from the time the decree is given, the decree goes forth to restore and build Jerusalem, it's going to be 69. That's what you have when you got seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69. It's going to be 69 weeks unto the Messiah, the Prince. Okay? That's what he's telling him. So, can we find a starting date? Yes, we can. The Scripture gives you one. It's found in the book of Ezra. Ezra, the 7th chapter, in verse 12, and it says, Artaxerxes, 
king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. That decree was given in 457 B.C. Now, we have a starting point, and he said from 457 B.C. unto the Messiah, the Prince, will be 69 weeks. Okay? What we find. Well, if I've got 69 weeks, let's put some things together and see if we can make this all work out. Now, if we get into a little math here, and it won't confuse you if you just follow carefully, all right? To begin with, the Bible says that in Bible prophecy, a day represents one year. Okay, that's what it tells us. I have appointed thee each day for a year, Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34. Again, he says each day for a year. So when you're looking at Bible prophecy, don't try to apply it out of Bible prophecy, but in Bible prophecy, a day will represent one year. Okay, so if I have 69 weeks and I want to find out well, how much time that is, how many days are there in a week? Seven. So I must simply multiply seven times 69. If I multiply seven times 69, that gives me 483. And each day represents a year. So if each day represents a year, that gives me a total of 483 years. Now, he said, this is the time that's determined upon your people. So, folks, these are years that we're pulling out of the 2,300 years. See, because that 2,300 days says a day represents a year, so I've got 2,300 years, and I'm pulling this out. You have to understand that because we're still looking at a total 2,300. All right. So he says 69 weeks. Well, in B.C. dates, you simply subtract. Okay? So if I got 483 years and I subtract 457 from that, that gives me 27. You have to take into consideration zero here. Okay? So it gives me 27 years, taking me to the date of 27 A.D. Well, let's see if we can establish what happened because he said he gave us 69 weeks unto what? Unto Messiah the Prince. Now, dear friend, if you're here, if you're watching tonight on television or listening on the radio or in the inter on the Internet, and you have some question in your heart about Jesus Christ being the Messiah and being the Son of God, then you need to take into account this prophecy. Because I'm sharing with you a text here where it's been foretold hundreds and hundreds of years exactly when Christ would begin his ministry. Let's see if that's what happened. Luke, the third chapter, verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the regions round the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John the Baptist went preaching, preaching a baptism for the remission of sin, and among those that came to John to be baptized 
was none other than Jesus Christ. Because if you come on down to the 21st verse of this same chapter, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heavens were open. Now, folks, this ties down the date for you because it says in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, if you look up in secular history, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, the date is 27 A.D. So, I mean, it ties it down solidly. And that, by the way, one of those things in that list about them, it says to s seal up the vision and the prophecy. And this is part of what seals up the vision and the prophecy. It establishes the date without any question of a doubt. So Jesus came, was baptized, watch as it goes on, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in who I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself began his, began his ministry at about 30 years of age, having, as supposed, the son of Joseph the son of Heli. So it tells us clearly that in 27 A.D., Jesus began his ministry as the Messiah. It would be 69 weeks unto Messiah the Prince, right exactly as the Scripture had foretold. Okay, so we've looked at 69 weeks. But we started out with how many weeks? Seventy. Seventy weeks are determined on our people. We've looked at 69, so that leaves us what? Well, that leaves us one week, right? Yeah, we have one week left over. And that is basically what we call the 70th week. All right? The 70th week. He said to seal up the vision and the prophecy. So we need to take a look at what took place on this 70th week. Most important, because it seals the prophecy, so there is no question about it. I run on to people that try to change this, and the reason they change it is because it doesn't fit why, the way they want to interpret Scripture. But you have to take a look at what the Scripture says. So let's look at this 70th week and see what it tells us. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifices and offerings. Now, when it says he shall confirm the covenant, this is talking about the covenant that God made with the Jewish people, that God made with people, period. A covenant that he made, and he said he was going to confirm the covenant with him for one week. And in the very middle of the week, he would bring the sacrifice and offerings to an end. Well, if I've got one week, and I'm going to take a look at it, so one week is how many years? Seven years. Okay? One week. Each day represents a year, so I've got seven year, years. If I add seven to 27 A.D., it takes me to 34 A.D. Okay, so that's the week we're going to look at. And it said in the middle of the week, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations or offerings to cease. If I go to the middle, that's how many years? Well, that's three and a half years. So if I go three and a half years, that takes me to the middle of the week, at which time he said the offering and sacrifices were all going to come to an end. Well, Christ's ministry lasted three and a half years. So if I come three and a half years, does the Scripture record anything that took place? And when they had come to a place called Calvary, 
There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the others on the left. Right in the middle of the week, he confirmed the covenant. Do you understand that? That he confirmed the covenant? That means, dear friend, that covenant that he made where he would forgive you of your sins and do away with your iniquity and make you his people. He f- sealed that, sealed that on Calvary. He died. He shed his blood on behalf of you and me. Right in the middle of the week. With his death, the sacrifices, the offerings came to an end because the Lamb of God had died. The supreme sacrifice in your behalf and mine came to happen, demonstrated his love towards us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He died there on the cross in your behalf and mine. That was exactly in the middle of the week, as he had prophesied. At the same time, in the temple, the priest is about ready to offer the sacrifice, the offering, when all of a sudden that veil that we talked about that separated the holy and the most holy place, that veil began to tear at the top. And it tore all the way to the bottom. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake and the rock split. And the way into the most holy place was opened up, showing that that sanctuary service had come to an end. The Lamb of God had died. As the Bible prophesied, it took place. But if I have three and a half years and I have left three and a half years, that takes me to 34 AD, he said, 70 weeks are what? Determine for your people and your holy city. He said, I'm going to give you 70 weeks, 490 years is determined upon you and your people. Well, when we get to 34 A.D., what happened? Time came to an end for the Jewish people. And I want to clarify something, folks. When he said 70 weeks are determined upon you and your people, it did not mean that they could not find salvation. It didn't mean that at all. It meant that God was going to give them 490 years to accomplish what he wanted them to do. But if they did not do that, then he was going to turn another direction. The Jewish people can find salvation just the same way as anyone else. Just simply by opening their heart and accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior gives them salvation. They bring with them a lot of things that you and I didn't know. They bring with them a heritage and a background that is absolutely wonderful and all that. And they find fulfillment in it, in Jesus Christ, in those things that they have believed and been taught all those years. When that person accepts Christ into their heart as their Savior, all that opens up and they become rich in their understanding of God's Word. So they're... They are blessed in a special way. But they can find salvation just like you and I can find salvation. But what happened? 
34 A.D., God called, called a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, on the road to Damascus. And Christ spoke to him, and there in the city of Damascus, he found Christ as his Savior. And he said, go, speaking of Ananias, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine, talking about Saul, to bear my name before what? Gentiles. So in 34 A.D., the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what happened. Seventy weeks are determined on your people. When that came to an end, the gospel went to the Gentiles. So as we look at this 2,300 unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That 2,300 years, we've looked at 490 of it. So I have to subtract 490 years off of 2,300. That's what I have to do. And when I subtract 490 off of 2,300, that leaves me 1,810 years. I have to add that 1,810 years to 34. And when I add that to it, it takes me to the date of 1844. At which time the Scripture is telling you that judgment began in heaven for unto 2,300 days. Then the sanctuary, referring to the sanctuary up in heaven, would be cleansed. And judgment, the cleansing process that took place, started in 1844. Christ came in before his father. And judgment began. And as it says, dear friend, if you have Christ, then he can stand in your place Amen. in the judgment. Amen. It's there. And with, if Christ stands in your place, you have passed from death unto life. Because he is the one that makes all the difference. He can say, I died for this person. I paid the price. I paid the debt that that individual rightfully owes according to the law. I paid that for him. Not only did I pay that for him, but I am giving to him my righteousness. And his righteousness, folks, is holy. It's just. It's good. It's spiritual. It meets all the qualifications of the law. And Christ grants that to you and to me. This is what he does for us. So when it says that angel, shouting with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of of his judgment has come, you and I need to know that judgment is going on up in heaven now. And when it ends, which surely will not be very long, Christ is going to say, it's finished. He's going to pronounce those words and he's going to come back. And you and I need to be ready for his coming. It says here, and worship him. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the springs of water. Worship God who made that. Oh, it worries me, folks. The devil is so smart. We we even get blindsided 
and we don't understand really what's happening and what's taking place. You remember Christ being on the mount? The devil took him to this exceeding high mountain, and he said to him, he showed him all the kingdoms of this world, everything. And he said, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. He said, just fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve, that you're to worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, no one else. Now, as we have studied the book of Revelation, we found out that there's a great red dragon. And you remember we identified that according to Revelation 12 and verse 9, that that great red dragon represents the devil. Yeah. It says it's the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. Also, we found out in our study the other night that in Revelation the 13th chapter, there's a beast. The beast from the sea. Watch what it says about them. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with them? So uh, this question of worship is very much involved in this message this first angel has, saying, watch out, be careful, worship the Lord, don't worship anybody else. Worship, just worship the Lord. But like I said, the devil comes in and the back door, and we don't even know what he's done. Because simply by coming into the educational system of our country, he's been able to introduce evolution, teaching our young people. Saying that you involved. This is how you came about. Now it says clearly, worship him who what? Made heaven and earth. So the question here, folks, is that of the creator. That Christ is the creator. One that made the world. If I can simply reach in and take away him being the creator, then I lose the part of worship. It denies that. Not only does it do away with him as the creator, the moment you move into evolution, it takes away the creation. It also takes away Christ as the Redeemer. Don't need a Savior. If I evolved, it does away with all those things, and we have been blindsided in this. And so it says that angel's proclaiming particularly to people today to worship him who made heaven and earth. This is the message that the the first angel has. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you will help us that we, in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ, will keep our minds and our hearts and our souls set upon you, and that we will worship only you. May we, day by day, follow you. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Remember that Our next presentation on the second angel's message deals with the fall of Babylon. And we're going to see who is Babylon. 
when we talk about Babylon. Who is Babylon? And what's involved in the fall of Babylon? All that we'll be taking a look at. Good night. God bless you. All around us, we see wanton suffering. In large cities, millions of human beings do not receive as much care and consideration as we give beasts to the field. Families are herded together in miserable projects. Children are born into these terrible places. They see nothing of the beauty God has created to delight their senses. They're left to grow up molded and fattened by wretched and wicked examples all around them. They hear the name of God only in profanity, impure words and fumes of liquor and tobacco and immoral behavior of every kind pervert their tender senses. Wretched and pitiful cries for food and clothing are heard by parents who know nothing about prayer or loving Savior. But these cries do not go unheard in heaven. God sees, God hears. Friends, our loving Father has entrusted us with abundance to supply the necessities of all. But sadly, we're not always faithful stewards. Many who have taken on the name of Christ spend his money for selfish pleasure, extravagant homes and clothing. They hardly give a suffering human a look of pity or a word of sympathy. We are to show the kindness of the Samaritan in food, clothing, and shelter for the poor. As Christians, our work is to reach the people who are neglected and win them to Christ. That's the goal of this ministry. We want them to know that He is able to save to the uttermost and restore them to His image. But in order to do this, we need your help. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series The Three Angels' Messages may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series including Beast from the Sea, United States, First Angel's Message, Second Angel's Message, Third Angel's Message, Second Coming of Christ, and The Seven Last Plagues may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.